I discovered that there's a young Italian Stevensonian <laughs> among us. It's a very good news for me. Lucio de, Cam de Capitani is a research fellow at the Cafoscari University of Venice. He has a PhD in English literature from the same university. His research interests include colonial, post-colonial, and world literature, especially Indian writing in English, Anglophone and Italophone migration literature, the connection between anthropology and literary studies, <laughs> travel writing and literary journalism. He has published papers on Robert Louis Stevenson, Amitav Ghosh, and Anita Desai. Today, the title of his paper is Greedy of All Pleasures, Divinely Free from Malice, Enjoyment and Ethics in Stevenson and Melville. Thank you very much. And many thanks to the organizers for this truly wonderful conference. Okay, so uh, as you can see from uh, my title, uh, this paper is attempting to uh, put together Stevenson and Melville. And of course, there is one uh, um, relatively easy way in which you could uh, connect Stevenson and Melville, which is, of course, the Pacific. Stevenson actually was, uh, uh, you know, uh, referenced Melville as one of, of his, uh, you know, uh, reference point uh, for the representation of the Pacific and actually called him uh, one, of the few, uh, one of the two writers who touched the South Seas with any genius. Um, now, I am going to talk about the, peach, the Beach of Reza eventually, but uh, more generally, I think, uh, uh, of course, the, the question in the framework of this conference uh, uh, is, of course, whether, is whether pleasure is a connecting point between Stevenson and Melville. And as you can guess from the fact that I'm giving this paper, my answer is yes. Um, so my hypothesis is that uh, um, Stevenson and Melville, at least some of their texts, of course, uh, may be connected by a similar conception of pleasure. Um, pleasure specifically as connected to humanist ethics and also to a view of society and relationship based on acknowledging the human need for connection. I realize that this is a very positive pepper in a sense, and I'm very glad that I, I'm talking after Penny was, uh, you know, it kind of showed the, the, the let's say, dark side of uh, humanism because of course, and I think it, it, it kind of works in this way. So. Um, now, I want to start uh, with the title. Um, so it, it, this is a composite title uh, taken from both Melville and uh, Stevenson. Greedy of all pleasure is actually how um, Stevenson defines uh, François Villon in his essay, uh, uh, François Villon, Student, Poet, and Housebreaker. Um, and uh, uh, I want to read from uh, this passage. Uh, um, basically, this passage is, uh, is of course, uh, uh, the, the moment in which uh, Stevenson is kind of finding an explanation for um, uh, Villon's uh, uh, fall uh, from poet to petty criminal. Um, and and he, he says this, um, For a man who is greedy of all pleasures and provided with little money and less dignity of character, we may prophesy a safe and speedy voyage downward. Humble or even trucking virtue may walk unspotted in this life, but only those who despise it, the pleasure or can afford to despise the opinion of the world. A man of, of strong, heady temperament like Vion is very differently tempted. His eyes lay hold on all provocation greedily, and his heart flames up at a look into impervious desire. He is snared and broached to by anything and everything, from a pretty face to a piece of pastry in a cook, cook shop window. He will drink to the rinsing of the wine cup, stay the latest at the tavern party, tap at the lit windows, follow the sound of singing, and bid the whole neighborhood for another reveler as he goes reluctantly homeward. Uh, and grudge himself every hour of sleep as a black empty period in which he cannot follow after pleasure. Such a person is lost if he have no dignity, or failing that, at least pride, which is its shadow and in many ways its substitute. Now, um, there is a very, uh, l l the, the most simplistic way to read this passage, of course, is to say pleasure is dangerous. Pleasure is something that will eventually lead you to ruin if you have no self-restraint. But I would like to, uh, um, let's say, uh, I, there are, I think, two, at least two insights that are kind of interesting about this passage. The first one is uh, that pleasure, uh, in the way it is described here, is inherently interpersonal. Uh, so only those who despise the pleasure of the, uh, the uh, pleasures can afford to despise the opinion of the world. It follows that being greedy of all pleasures signifies engaging with the world in one way or another. Um, so pleasure is inherently interpersonal. Um, and then there is uh, this whole description. Um, so mm, mm, Stevenson seems to be adopting a judgmental approach about the idea of being greedy of all pleasures, but at the same time is creating such a visceral and compelling description of, of this man from whom being separated by enjoyment and conviviality is basically, uh, means basically death. 
Um, so the reader is, is, is led to believe that this, uh, this, this uh, pleasure seeking may be something more essential than simple satisfaction of an instinct or falling prey to temptation, but it is instead um, a form of exuberant vitality that, that is, I would argue, uh, an essential part of Villon's humanity. Um, so in short, this passage to me conveys the idea that being greedy of all pleasure is not in itself a vice, but it is a legitimate particular form of humanity that, however, forces human beings to think of their relationship with the world, confronting us with the choice of how we interact with other human beings. Uh, so basically what Stevenson is asking us is how do you engage uh, with the world through pleasure, and more importantly, to what aim? And this kind of leads us quite naturally to Melville, because uh, um, if we look at Moby Dick, uh, uh, of course uh, we have the character and narrator of Ishmael, who could be defined as greedy of all pleasures in many ways, so he's this curious, enthusiastic character, willing to explore, willing to experiment, and willing to know more. Um, but he also offers us a specific connection between pleasure and uh, an idea of social renewal, which is a, a way in which you interact with the world through pleasure, I would say. Um, so there is a chapter, a very infamous chapter in a sense of Moby Dick, chapter 94, called A Squeeze of the Hand. Uh, and what's happening in this passage is basically that the sailors are, uh, are being tasked to, the sailors of the Pequod are being tasked to uh, uh, squeeze lumps uh, of condensed spermaceti into a fluid substance. And, and this is actually a very gruesome business in, in reality. Um, but uh, Ishmael kind of transfigure all of this process into a kind of uplifting ecstatic experience. Only that uh, the imagery he decides to use uh, uh, is decidedly not a spiritual one, is decidedly profane. And he alludes to pleasures that are not uh, spiritual at all, or maybe are spiritual in a different way. Uh, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globals of infiltrated tissues, I felt divinely free from all will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the morning long. I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co laborers hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globals. Such an abounding affection and friend, uh, friendly, uh, loving feeling did this avocation beget that I at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally. As much as to say, oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish social acerbities or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us all squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. <laughs> so this rather cheeky passage, I would say, um, is unequivocally, on the one hand, uh, a joke. Uh, a phallic joke or a metaphor of uh, queer sex or, or sex in general, or masturbation, whatever you want. But uh, I would argue that on the, on the other end, it can also be read uh, very seriously uh, as a, sa a statement to be taken at face value. Uh, so it is a statement about how sharing moments of pleasure and mutual enjoyment will eventually uh, uh, foster a relationship of love and build a better alternative society. So the idea is that pleasure is a constructive force, uh, to, or at least some forms of pleasure, are um, a constructive force to build a better society and construct new social bonds. So my argument uh, for, for the rest of the paper is going to be that uh, um, both Stevenson and Melville are interested, uh, I would argue, um, to explore ways in which it is possible to be at the same time greedy of all pleasure, like Villon, and divinely free from malice, like Ishmael, which means, in my reading, um, a combination of the openness to the sensuous, to the pleasurable and the erotic, as a legitimate path to express one's humanity, uh, while simultaneously reaching empathy, connection with other human beings, uh, or even changing society, as well as cleansing oneself, uh, oneself from hatred. In other words, the idea is sustaining uh, an ethical and hedonistic uh, stance at the same time. And I want to explore this idea a little bit more uh, by confronting two, two, let's say, two episodes. Uh, um, the encounter between Ishmael and Quiqueg, the Polynesian harpooner uh, that uh, becomes Ishmael's best friend, and the encounter between Uma and Wilshire in the beach of Faleza. So I've chosen this, uh, this illustration. is a recent illustration by two, uh, uh, um, two illustrators called Vittoria Maderna and Federico Piatti, and is for a, for a children's book. And although it is a very innocent uh, picture in a way, I think it captures some of the uh, uh, in themes that I wanted to discuss. So that's why I've chosen this, this one for, for talking about this, this passage. 
So these two characters meet at the beginning of Bambi Dick, and uh, um, they are forced actually to share a bed for the night, and uh, because there, there, are, mm, there is just one room. Uh, and uh, Ishmael is initially appalled at the idea of sharing a bed with what he calls at the time an abominable savage. Um, but in the first chapter, he, he grows incre increasingly uh, um, at ease, attracted and fascinated by Quiquig, and such curiosity blossoms into a, a friendship. And there are many ways in which this friendship can, the, 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 the birth of this friendship can be framed in terms of pleasure. Um, there is, of course, uh, on the one hand, the pleasure of conviviality uh, with a newfound friend discovered in an unexpected place. Um, but there, is also more, there are also more distinctly sen more sensuous pleasures uh, connected to um, Quiquag's own uh, physical presence, both in terms of sight, we might even say of beauty, and in terms of touch. So, for instance, on the one hand, uh, Ishmael is very fascinated uh, by Quiquag's appearance, and at some point he starts to comment very positively about his countenance and appearance. Um, and then, of course, there is the element of touch in the sense that uh, um, they are forced to share a bed together. And, and, and a detail that, uh, you know, uh, is very interesting, of course, is that uh, as soon as they wake up uh, the first night they spend in the same bed, this happens. I found Quiquag's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. And uh, um, at, at the beginning, uh, Ishmael is, is annoyed by this circumstance. But in the, over, over a few chapters, he becomes very fond of this uh, situation and aptly embraces uh, uh, the role of Quiquag's wife and also bedfellow, as they are defined at some point. Um, and this uh, uh, kind of culminates uh, in this uh, kind of uh, 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 passage. This is Ishmael talking. I began to be sensible to of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hands were turned against the wolfish world. The soothing savage had redeemed it. Began, uh, I began to feel mysteriously drawn towards him. And those same things that would have repelled most others, they were very magnets that thus drew me. And, and this is also kind of uh, uh, mirrored with, uh, with a gesture of, uh, of friendship on, on a quick quick side. Anyway. Um, and then, uh, uh, um, so I think, uh, of course, uh, there, is, uh, uh, th there are many, many possible readings about this passage. There are, of course, also uh, specifically queer readings of, of Melville. But whatever reading you, you, you opt for, uh, there is uh, uh, certainly, uh, um, I would say that this is certainly a relationship that blossoms through the enjoyment of a variety of interconnected forms of pleasure, both emotional and sensuous. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, this pleasure is also the catalyst for, uh, again, um, a spiritual and moral effect, which is initiating Ishmael to a form of humanist ethics, we might even say cosmopolitanism. Um, and there is uh, this particular passage in which uh, uh, Quique, um, Ishmael uh, decides to pray together with Quiqueg, and it is a moment where he recognizes Quiqueg as his fellow man. Um, so I find significant paral uh, par parallels uh, between this sequence and the encounter between Uma and Wilshire in the beach of Falesa. The very first uh, parallel is that uh, uh, we are, of course, talking about the birth of an interracial relationship uh, in which pleasure and the need of connection for connection play a key role. Um, so this is the first uh, you know, point of uh, connection, of course. Um, so, and in general speaking, the Beach of Aliza, of course, is the story of a white man that arrives uh, in, in, in a Polynesian island, and he has initially two ideas. Uh, the first idea is to find companionship among white people. So he says, uh, Wilshire famously says that he's sick for white neighbors. Um, and at the same time, he thinks of, he think of Pacific Islanders as uh, uh, either business opportunities or sexual objects. In a way, is separating his desire of uh, of connection from a more you know uh, sensual kind of desire. Um, but of course, then he ends up uh, finding companionship and a sense of belonging in his interracial marriage with Uma. And I would argue that. Uh, um, mm, the Bishop of Lezar, uh, rather the, the interesting aspect of the Bishop of Lezar, uh, is that uh, uh, instead of creating an opposition between pleasure and ethical awakening in developing uh, uh, Wilshire's arc, uh, well, Stevenson actually connects these two aspects, the, the ethical awakening and the, the, you know, the sensitivity to pleasure. Uh, in the same way uh, that Mel in, in, in which Melville, uh, pleasure is connected to this kind of spiritual uplifting and the development of this humanist fellow feeling. Um, that, of course, doesn't mean that uh, uh, pleasure seeking in general in the Beach of Aleza is unequivocally positive. Uh, we could say that uh, the whole fake wedding uh, and the whole first part of the novella is, uh, 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 let's say, a condemnation of uh, an easy satisfaction of pleasure within a colonial setting. 
Uh, but it is also important to, to point out that uh, it is precisely the transformation uh, of uh, um, uh, Wilshire from an individualistic adventurer to a caring husband that is connected to a shift in his understanding of pleasure, I would say. So we shift from an attitude of, uh, we could say, predatory colonial pleasure to an idea of a shared pleasure, of pleasure as an instrument of connection. And I would say this process starts immediately after the fake wedding. There is this uh, 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 gesture, uh, so Wilshire forgets himself and takes Uma's hand, which I would take also as a, as a kind of a, 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 a in, in hint that he doesn't really want erotic adventures, but he's really looking for some form of companionship. And uh, working on this uh, sentiment, uh, uh, Wilshire is able to find his true standing with Uma eventually. Um, so there is, of course, the, this other uh, uh, important passage. Uh, she threw her, uh, and this is uh, when basically uh, Wilshire has decided to commit himself to Uma, uh, in, spite of, in spite of the of the taboo and the risk he has for his for his business. Um, she threw her arms about me, sprang close up, and pressed her face to mine in the island way of kissing, so that I was wetted all, uh, with all, uh, with her tears, and my heart went out to her wholly. I never had anything so near me as this little brown bit of a girl. Many things went together and all helped to turn my head. She was pretty enough to eat. She seemed uh, she was my only friend in that queer place. I was ashamed that I had spoken rough to her, and she was a woman and my wife and a kind of a baby besides that I was sorry for. And the salt of her tears was in my mouth. So the thing is that erotic desire is still present in this passage. It is not erased after Will she decides to do the ethical thing and marry Uma. Um, um, it remains a part of Wilshire's feelings towards Uma, but matures into a non-exploitative relationship, which encompasses sexual attraction, but also gratitude for a friendship, sense of responsibility, and a more indefinite feeling, uh, fellow feeling uh, <coughs> connected to sharing this um, material predicament. Of course, it is also uh, alongside uh, a residual paternalism that Wilshire will never get rid of. Um, so, in a sense, we could say that Wilshire is allowed to remain greedy of all pleasure, but by learning to leave his pleasure to an ethical and genuine connection with Uma, uh, is also be he also becomes divinely free from malice, to reprise the expression. So, pleasure is a kind of ally to a moral awakening in the end. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting that uh, th this other sentence, which follow immediately the paragraph I've just read, I forgot my employers and the strange kind of service I was doing them when I preferred my fancy to their business. And uh, this idea of preferring my fancy to the business, on the one hand, could be taken as, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a, 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 a Wilshire criticizing his, his own uh, uh, a kind of, uh, I don't remember the word, well, anyway, as a negative thing. But actually, uh, it is precisely when Wilshire decides to follow his fancy, which is, in a sense, his pleasure, that it, it chooses uh, a more, you know, ethical framework to work on. And I want to conclude with a very uh, odd citation which I just found uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was l watching this uh, video essays, Natalie Wynn, OK, Counterpoints. And this passage, I think, uh, uh, which is uh, spoken by a character in this video, uh, I think kind of summarizes my point. It is a passage about erotic love. Erotic love is not aimless pleasure seeking. It is longing for connection, for recognition, for wholeness, to traverse the lonely void that separates us from each other, to liberate repressed energy, to feel alive. Love is not in the flesh, it's not temptation, it's nothing like the urge to punch someone in the face, it's nothing like being an alcoholic, it's not a craving, it's a yearning. But you people don't understand that, because you are vulgarians, you have no sense of humanity, and you have no sense of the erotic. So what I would argue, of course, is that Melville and Stevenson, they are both interested in connecting, of course, the sense of the humanity and a sense of the erotic. They both explore how pleasure is not inherently sinful. It is something that is essential for human beings, but it can, it can also be uplifting and spiritual if it is connected to a sense of humanity. And thank you very much.